So Plato, whenever we think we've got a handle on what's going on and we, we're beginning to grasp what Plato's up to, he goes and sort of throws a curveball and confounds us again and just says, you know, I'm, a, I'm one step ahead of you. <laughs> Is the myth of Atlantis more than a myth? Is it based on historical evidence? Or is it an important allegory that Plato just made up? Hello, this is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today I'm talking with Angie Hobbs, the renowned British philosopher and academic who specializes in ancient Greek philosophy and ethics. She is professor of public understanding of philosophy at the University of Sheffield. She contributes regularly to radio and TV programs and other media, including 24 appearances on BBC's In Our Time on Radio 4. She has spoken at the World Economic Forum at Davos, the Houses of Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, and Westminster Abbey, and has been a guest on Desert Island Discs, Private Passions, and Test Match Special. She was a judge of the Ban Booker International Prize 2019 and was on the World Economic Forum Global Future Council 2018-9 for Values, Ethic, and Innovation. Her most recent publication for the general public is Plato's Republic, a Ladybird expert book. But before we begin, a quick thank you to our Classical Wisdom Society members who make this podcast possible. If you would like to become a society member and help support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click start here. Now onto the myth of Atlantis and whether or not it's real. Today, I would like to talk about the story of Atlantis and it's definitely a captivating story and a lot of people know of it, but I think a lot of people don't really know the, the details. So I think perhaps the best place to begin is just with a very brief recap of the story of Atlantis and what information we kind of have on it, the sources, the, the original story. Oh, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Yes, so Plato, the first mention we get of Atlantis it is in two dialogues by Plato, the Timaeus and the Critias. The Timaeus, just a short section near the beginning, 20 to 26, and then the Critias, which is cut short, it's the whole of the Critias. He's writing these dialogues in the 360s BCE, but dramatically they're set in about 425 BC. And of when Socrates was still alive and Socrates uh, and his friend Critias are uh, two of the main characters. So that's the, the kind of setting. Uh, in the Timaeus, uh, we first of all, that the setting is that the Timaeus is set dramatically the day after uh, Socrates has outlined his ideally just state in the Republic. Uh, so this is meant to be the next day. They are indefatigable. Um, and Socrates says, you know, he'd like to see his ideally just state tested in action. And he particularly wants to see it tested in war and to see whether its virtues hold up in, uh, under conditions of extreme stress. And Critias says, well, you know, his friend Critias says, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, you, you, you mentioned this yesterday and I remembered this story last night. And it's a story I heard when I was a very young boy and I heard it from my grandfather, another Critias, when he was a very old man. And he'd heard it um, from uh, his father, uh, who had been a friend of the great Athenian lawgiver, uh, Solon. And it's a story that Solon says he heard while traveling in Egypt, um, in the town of Sais in the, in the Nile Delta. And he says he heard it from Egyptian priests. And, you know, amazingly, it, this tale, it's about uh, this ancient, uh, island kingdom of Atlantis, uh, which was um, 
sort of uh, situated uh, in the far west beyond the pillars of Heracles, which is uh, the, the, the Straits of Gibraltar. So it's situated kind of somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And it got too big for its boots and it decided to sort of invade the Eastern Mediterranean. It already had an empire up to... Um, uh, Etruria in, in what we now call Italy and uh, to, to Libya along the coast of North Africa, but it wanted to go further east into Egypt and it wanted to take Greece and it attacks Greece. And amazingly, amazingly, says Critias, I think with heavy irony, we'll discuss this later, by some miraculous chance, um, this our prehistoric Athens before the current city uh, was identical to your ideally just republic in every respect, in every detail. It so coincidental. The same. <laughs> oh, I know. How convenient is that? And Atlantis, big, powerful, mighty Atlantis, ta attacks little, poor, apparently powerless prehistoric Athens, but but the virtues, the self-discipline, the courage of these prehistoric Athenians win the day. They fend off the Atlantis and its empire and virtue wins. However, and this is an extraordinary twist, which we'll discuss, a, a virtue doesn't win for long because the very next day, both prehistoric Athens and Atlantis and its empire are destroyed in one terrific earthquake and tsunami, which just destroys them all in this massive natural cataclysm. Um, and so that's the end of, of that. So here's this um, extraordinary tale. So Atlantis is initially brought in as the bad guy. It's the bad guy in the story. It's prehistoric Athens that's meant to be the good guy. And this is a tale um, of a, a war that was meant to have occurred 9,000 years before uh, Solon visited these Egyptian priests. Um, and the Egyptian priests, you know, so they've, they've got this sort of oral memory of it. And it, they said that um, unfortunately their written records only go back 8,000 years. <laughs> they can't quite find it exactly proven in their written records. Um, so it's brought in initially to provide a kind of um, a worthy opponent to virtuous but poor prehistoric Athens to show how virtue can overcome wealth and power. But we're all kind of fragile in the face of the gods. So that's that's the Timaeus. And we're, there's a lot of interesting clues and jokes in the Timaeus about how we're meant to interpret all that. But let's just stick with this ancient Atlantis a bit more. And then in the, the next dialogue, the Critias, which, as I've said, is um, cut short. So we only have a few chapters of the Critias. And in this, um, Critias describes the uh, island of Atlantis in much more detail. And it's interesting, I think, that it is only ever Critias who talks about Atlantis, not Socrates. I think that might be a bit of a clue. Anyway, so it was fabulously wealthy and powerful, opulent. We've seen that it's situated beyond the pillars of Heracles, um, our Straits of Gibraltar. But we should also remember that that far western edge of the Mediterranean, yes, it, it was known to be a geographical location, but it was also a kind of place of myth and romance, a sort of fairy tale place in the Greek imagination. And it, it, this is, it's really at the edge of the known world. So we're, we're where geography and mythology meet at this point. So it's very, it's fabulously powerful, wealthy, technologically advanced. It's got great plumbing. It's got hot and cold springs. Uh, it's just very abundant in fruit and flowers. You know, there's food dropping off the trees. Uh, it's a lovely and luxurious way of life. There are gardens, there are gymnasia, there's a horse track. Uh, so it's a really beautiful sort of idyllic um, description. It's, it's really lavishly done and in such detail, such detail. Plato goes into all the measurements in, in great detail. Um, 
This island is rich in metals, gold, silver, and a mysterious metal called orichalc. We don't know about orichalc. It kind of means mountain copper, but is this, it seems to be a fantastical made up metal. Uh, bulls and elephants roam Atlantis. So it has ivory too. The bulls are gonna be interesting. We're gonna come back, I think, to the bulls. Um, now the main, the sort of the central citadel uh, is surrounded by uh, concentric circles of land and canals uh, crossed by elaborate bridges and the buildings are made from red, white and black stone and again that's quite a telling detail and we're going to come back to that I think. Uh, it's ruled by five pairs of male twins. Um, the oldest uh, is the chief king, and these are all descendants of uh, the very first sort of um, kings on Atlantis, who were the offspring of the sea god Poseidon and a mortal woman called Clato. So initially there was this uh, union between a god and a mortal woman and Poseidon and, and Clato, and they give birth to five pairs of male twins and the oldest is top king and the descendants of the, those original five pairs of twins uh, still rule the island. We're not told why they should go on and on being five pairs of male twins but there you go. The kings rule according to the precepts of Poseidon which are inscribed on a temple of Orichalc, that's uh, that mountain copper, that mysterious metal, within the temple of Poseidon, which is in the center of the citadel, right at the center of the island. And bulls roam in this temple. It's lavishly visual. It's, it's wonderfully done. The kings assemble in the temple alternately every five or six years, uh, not showing any preference to odd or even numbers. Um, and they to discuss what's going on, to pass judgment, to see if they need to change any of the laws. Um, first, they hunt a bull and then they sacrifice the bull and then they drink wine mixed with the blood of the bull. And then they pass judgment in robes of dark blue. I love, I love the detail about the dark. So oh, much detail. It's it really... is. It, it's all, it's all really quite kind of. It's delightfully sort of new agey, isn't it? The, the dark blue robes and everything. And all on Atlantis prosper. So we've had this luxurious, sort of luscious description of life on this island, this halcyon island. And all on Atlantis prosper just so long as. Uh, the kings care for their wealth and uh, power less than they care for virtue. So, so long as virtue is ruling them and keeping their desires for wealth and power in check, all goes well. But when their lust for wealth and power gets the better of them and they decide to expand their already large empire in the west of the Mediterranean and expand it into the east, that's when the gods decide to punish them says Critias, and that's where the Critias ends. Uh, why, why does it end? We can talk about that a bit later. So yeah, a really detailed, a really enjoyable description. I mean, it is, it's huge fun. I really recommend people go and read the Timaeus and the Critias, and you can get them all in, in the same translations. And uh, it's a very enjoyable read. And you can read all about the Atlantis legend in, you know, in an, an hour or two, can't you? Yeah, it, it is amazing, though, as you say, like the, the richness and detail, you know, it, it's so thorough, um, which sort of makes me come to our next question in a way is, is that you've been very vocal about Plato largely inventing the story of Atlantis. And, you know, when you think of all that detail, you're like, where would he, I mean, he must be just super imaginative. Um, but I'd love to kind of get into your reasons for this case, and perhaps the best place to start with is, is how is the story really told by Plato in the initial interactions um, to kind of justify your, the position? 
Yes, yeah. Well, you make such a good point about how, you know, richly imaginative it is. And of course, we should bear in mind that Plato certainly has the imagination to make this whole thing up. Uh, we have utopian fantasies in the Republic and the laws and the statesmen. There are myths and the symposium and the Gorgias. So he's absolutely got the imagination to do this. But well, let's look at the evidence. So this is fascinated, as we'll see, it fascinated people in Plato's shortly after his death, and, uh, and it's gone on fascinating people ever since. Right, let's look at how Critias says he heard the story. So he says that his Critias, the uh, Socrates' friend, uh, says that he heard it first when he was a young boy uh, from his grandfather, another, another Critias, at the festival of Apaturia. Uh, a festival in uh, in October, I think. But the key thing here is there is also a Greek word apater, which means deception. Mm. Now, the etymology is disputed, but it wasn't disputed by the ancient Greeks. the The key point for us is the ancient Greeks thought that the festival of Apaturia was linked to their word apater, deception. So that's what matters for us. So we've already got a little kind of, you know, trick thrown in. I mean, Plato would be brilliant, wouldn't he, at writing those sort of detective thrillers for, sun well, we have them in Sunday night in the UK, but I'm sure around the world. He'd be so good at putting in little red herrings and byways in the plot. Now, the grandfather had um, heard the story from his father, uh, Dropides, and his father uh, was a friend of the Athenian lawgiver, Solon. Uh, Solon is living uh, 6382. Oh gosh, let me see, I've got it here. Here we go, 558 BCE. So that chronology actually would work. Solon, as we've seen, had heard it from Egyptian priests in Sais in the Nile Delta. Solon had been telling, and now what's interesting is why did the priests tell Solon this story? Solon had been telling the priests about the Greek legend of Deucalion and Pyrrha, which is their kind of version of Noah's Ark yeah. and a great flood. And so it's not just in Hebrew uh, law that we have a story of, you know, a huge flood and, and nowhere in the ark. The Greeks had that too. They have Deucalion and Pyrrha. So we have enormous floods all over the eastern Mediterranean, which I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there have always been earthquakes and tsunamis there, so it would figure. But the particular priest he's talking to mocks Solon. And this is a, a very famous a line from Plato, and I love it, and it really gets you guessing. The, the Egyptian priest says, oh, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are always children. There is no such thing as an old Greek. I.e., we Egyptians, we have the ancient culture. You Greeks are the new kids on the block, but also you are gullible. And who is Plato chiefly writing for in the first instance? Greeks. So he's kind of really, really um, having fun here. We, sh we should never underestimate Plato's sense of humour. He's just, he's got a really wicked sense of humour. And the priest tells Solon that there have been many natural catastrophes uh, throughout history in both Greece, Egypt, elsewhere. Um, some by fire, some by flood. There have been many natural catastrophes before Deucalion and, and Pyrrha, but these catastrophes have been forgotten by the Greeks um, because every time a catastrophe sort of hits, uh, the Greeks, they lose the art of writing and they lose all their records, whereas the Egyptians have their records preserved in the hot sand in the desert and, and their records go back 8000 years. But <laughs> as we've already seen, this war between prehistoric Athens um, and uh, Atlantis was meant to have happened 9,000 years ago, so conveniently there can't possibly be any written records of it, even in Egypt. Okay, so that's the story. Um, as we'll see in a bit, there are lots of sort of ways in which um, things could get confused in that tale of transmission. So, I mean, 
the Egyptian priests could just have been lying. Yeah. So let, let's let's suppose let's supposing that Solon really did go to Egypt, and a lot of stories say he did. And let's supposing he did meet some Egyptian priests. We don't know for sure, but let's supposing he did. A lot of tales say that he did. Well, that the Egyptian priests could have been making it up, or they could have been just having a, a bit of a joke, or they could have been telling Solon what he wanted to hear. I mean, what do you tell your tourist? You know, a very heroic tale about your ancestors in prehistoric Athens. It's very flattering. Um, so they could have got it gone. Solon could have misheard. He could have misremembered. We, I mean, what language are they speaking? Do these Egyptian priests speak Greek? They might do. It was a very, I mean, the, the Nile Delta, there was a lot of trade going on. There were a lot of Greek sort of trading ports there. It's possible. But he could have misheard, misremembered. Um, Critias goes out of his way. This is Socrates' friend. Critias goes out of his way that he was really young when he heard the tale. And he will see if he can remember what he was heard when he was a young boy. Um, and he goes out of his way to emphasize his grandfather was really old. And, you know, old men's memories are imperfect. So there's lots of possibilities for the story to have got mangled on its journey from the Egyptian priests down to the young boy Critias, even supposing, um, even supposing that Solon did hear something in the first place. At this point, you have to ask then what textual evidence do we have for it existing and for Plato making it up? Well, exactly. So we've seen that he's certainly got the imagination to make it up. Um, and we've seen that there are all sorts of places in the transmission where it could go horribly wrong. But, but there is textual evidence that at least at some level, Plato wants us to regard this story as true at some level. That's what's going to be key. Um, we've seen that the chronology is certainly possible. Um, and also Critias declares that Solon, the wisest of the wise men, once vouched for its truth. Now, Plato, though he's often very critical of, of predecessors and authorities, he's normally very respectful of Solon. Really all the Greeks were. He was hugely widely respected as one of the seven wise men. So if Solon is vouching for its truth, I don't think Plato would then say that the whole thing is just a joke. There's some kind of truth going on here, but, but what layer of truth? Is it a factual truth? Is it some kind of philosophical or moral truth? We'll, we'll see. Also, Plato's always fascinated by Egyptian culture and Egyptian history, um, and that, that runs throughout his dialogues. And, and there's certainly stories that when he left uh, Athens, when he was so dismayed when Socrates was put to death in 399, and, and Plato went traveling for 10 years, he traveled all over Greece, he went to Sicily, he went to southern Italy, and there are a lot of stories that he also traveled in Egypt, and I, I think it is highly likely. Um, so he does respect Egyptian culture very, very deeply, however, and we're back to the the, the, the kind of the confusing, the deliberately confusing clues here, there are also plenty of places in Plato's dialogues where I'm afraid to say, and I apologize for this, he criticizes Egyptians for not being trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And we get that in the laws, we get that in the Republic. And so, of course, I don't remotely endorse that. But the point is that Plato kind of thinks, oh, I, I love Egypt. I have great respect for Egypt. But I don't entirely trust everything that Egyptians tell me. So uh, there's that clue. But again, at in the Timaeus, I think it's Timaeus 26, uh, Socrates says that one of the wonderful things about the story you've just told is that it's not a mythos, it's not a myth, but it's a true story. It's a logos. It's a true account. He actually says an alethinos logos, a true account. So that's Socrates saying it's true. And Critias, um, in, in the dialogue called the Critias, he makes a pointed reference to the fact that he has Solon's manuscript. He actually has a physical object with memories of this tale written down. So plenty of 
kind of pointers that at some level it's true, but also plenty of pointers in the text for fictionality in some ways. So um, we've seen that Critias goes out of his way to say, oh, I don't know if I could remember, and I was very young, and my grandfather was very old. Um, some elements of the tale, as we've seen, are clearly fantastical. I mean, that this metal orichalc, the, 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 the initial union between a sea god, Poseidon, and Plato, uh, the human. So if Plato's not making these elements up, somebody is. Uh, I mean, it, you know, of course, it might not be Plato making up all these details, but somebody is. Somebody is making up some of these fairy tale details. And... Um, you know, as we've touched on that bit in Timaeus, in Timaeus 25, where um, Critias says, you know, by some miraculous chance, prehistoric Athens matches your ideally just state, Socrates, in every detail. Now, surely very, very heavy irony. So, wow, uh, you've got this real mix. Now, I my theory is that Plato is doing this quite deliberately. He doesn't want people to be able to know for sure. Um, and, and, and that's, you've got the level of details we've seen, you know, the very precise measurements. So if he doesn't want people to know for sure, then he, he wants it to remain a myth. And I think that's something that we're, we're going to be discussing in some detail. You know, it's so funny, the idea of, of details being um, like a, an element to conveying truth, but purposely done. Like I always think of Gabriel Garcia Marquez in A Hundred Years of Solitude. I mean, oh. he specifically said that the element of magical realism is to, by putting in such extensive details that it makes you feel like it's true. It's not just you know, thousands of, of yellow butterflies, it has to be 1,532 <laughs> yellow butterflies, and oh. therefore it feels more true. And I mean, that's a, a literary device. I mean, it's- Yeah, oh, I'm, oh God, I must read that book again. I absolutely loved it. Loved Gorgeous. It. Gorgeous. Um, well, I mean, and again, the, the whole issue of myths is really brought to the surface in the Timaeus and uh, the Critias. We've not only seen Socrates say, oh, you know, the great thing about this story is that it's not a mythos, it's not a myth, it's an alethanos logos, a true story. So we, that's Plato absolutely deliberately juxtaposing mythos and logos, myth and account, myth and, you know, um, logical sort of reasoned account side by side to get us thinking. But at the beginning of the Critias, the character of Critias makes this extraordinary claim, an extraordinary claim. He says, everything we say, he says, all the statements we make are inevitably in pictures and images. We can't do anything else. It's an extraordinary claim. It's as if, and I don't think he's even um, just saying it about the Atlantis story or about religion or the gods. I think he's talking about language generally, um, or at least that's the view I'm coming on to now. When I was younger, I thought, oh, he's, he means that the Atlantis story, we can only talk about this in myths and images. But I now think he's talking about language generally that every, language is metaphorical. We speak in myths and images. We can't directly represent the thing in itself. So that's an extraordinary claim. In the Timaeus 22, the Egyptian priest, who's the one particularly talking to Solon, says that a myth may symbolize um, a cosmological process or a historic event. He actually says myths can have a symbolic function. He goes out of his way to say that. So it seems to me Plato couldn't be giving us more clues that this story of Atlantis, it is a myth, um, it, it, but it is meant to symbolize things which are deeply, deeply true. And the fact that it's a myth and that its surface details are made up does not mean that it's false. It does not mean it's a lie. And I think that's really... Um, Interesting. And 
And in other dialogues, like Plato's Phaedrus, we again, we get this idea in the Phaedrus that myths, allegories are meant to be interpreted and they might be representing some kind of historical or cosmological event or some moral truth. The idea is that it is a myth, but he wants you to believe in it. Otherwise, you're not going to get the lesson from it. I think so. Yes. Yeah. I mean, certainly while you're reading it, you're meant to sort of suspend disbelief. What, just what you were saying about Marquez, that while you're immersed in it, you're meant to not be kind of thinking, oh, that's not true. You're meant to be really living this and imagining in this city and this story and this war. And that's how you'll get the most impact from it, because your emotions will be involved as well as your reason. Yeah, because it's important. I mean, Plato has this in this period when he's writing these dialogues, he has this tripartite psychology of reason and a spirited element, uh, reason which loves truth and reality, a spirited element which desires uh, success and victory and the appetites which desire physical satisfaction and money. And Plato's always very clear in his writing that he needs to engage not just our reason, but our emotions. And otherwise we're not really going to absorb the lessons he wants us to learn. So he's always trying to, you know, it's one of the reasons he writes in dialogue form with these very vivid characters and these very beautifully realized settings. So emotionally we can go on a journey. And I think that's really important. And, and also I think, we need to remember that at this stage, so as Plato is writing this, these dialogues in the 360s, setting them a bit earlier, but at this stage, there isn't a clear distinction between what we would term myth and history. The Greeks were just not so interested to distinguish myth and history as we are. They're not so interested in precise factual recoveries of the past. They're interested in myths and histories being used for political and ethical, you know, moral, spiritual ends. That's what they're interested in. So they don't really have a very clear distinction. I mean, just think of the word mythology. It comes from the word muthos, myth and logos, you know, account, reason, whatever. So the very word mythology suggests a kind of blending Oh, just one final thing, so yeah. one final thing, one final joke on Plato's part is to complicate things still further. Um, all this stuff I've said about how important myth is for Plato and how he wants them to be interpreted and to remain alive. And I, I passionately believe that. Um, and that's why he's making largely making up this legend of Atlantis. But, but let's not forget what we, we, we touched on this before, Socrates saying, we must remember this is not a muthos, but a true account, a true logos. So Plato, whenever we think we've got a handle on what's going on, and we, we're beginning to grasp what Plato's up to, he goes and sort of throws a curveball and confounds us again and just says, you know, I'm, a, I'm one step ahead of you. <laughs> Oh, so, I love yeah. his wit. I love it. Yeah. Um, and and I, I really want to talk more about myth and the role and, and our relationship to it. But before we get to that, I kind of want to go back to a bit more of like the evidence stuff uh, and, and to kind of get back to the nitty gritty, because you mentioned previously that uh, the ancients themselves debated whether this was true or not. And that, you know, that they weren't confused about the, the terms uh, with regards to deception. So maybe we could touch a little bit more on like how this debate was back then and yeah. how it's evolved. You know? Oh my goodness me. I mean, absolutely fascinating. It's a podcast in its own right. Well, as we've seen, these mentions in the Timaeus and the Critias written in the 360s, we think, are the first mentions of this legend of Atlantis. Shortly after that, masses and masses of mentions. They're all, it's all over the place. There, is, but we can't say for sure that any of the subsequent discussions of Atlantis are not coming through Plato. We can't say for sure that any of the subsequent textual references are independent of Plato's text. 
and and many of them are very explicit that they're, they're that they are discussing Plato's text, and that's what they're doing. Did he make it up or not? Now, well, we've very shortly after Plato, um, we've got a student of a student of his called Crantor, who is not very famous now, very famous in his own day, and he's sort of uh, living. Um, probably end of the, uh, well, sorry, he's probably born in about the middle of uh, the fourth century BCE. He dies in about the 270s. So that's the kind of timeline. He seems to have thought it could be true. Uh, and he's pretty close to Plato, as I said, a student of a student of Plato's, and I think he was leader of the academy for a while as well, and he thought it could be true. Uh, Posidonius, and we're talking here sort of second to first centuries BCE, he, again, he doesn't commit himself, but he thinks it could be true. Uh, the geographer Strabo, um, born, when was Strabo born? Um, so he's born in the middle of the first century BCE, dies 20 something common era. Uh, again, he thinks that it, it might be true. So none of them completely commit themselves, but they all think on balance, it's certainly possible, even probable. Um, you know, I'm very happy. I can, I can go into detailed evidence for them if you want, but let's just sort of name some names. Aristotle, however, Plato's chief student, um, we can't say this with 100% certainty, but with 99% certainty, the evidence is that Aristotle thinks he made it up. And he obviously... And that's uh, a big claim. I mean, that you know, is a big claim. Them way different levels, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm, you know, if you want, I'm very happy to go through the, the detailed textual evidence for these writers, but it's good, I think, just to get some ideas on the table. Uh, Plutarch, uh, again, writing in the Common Era, first century in the Common Era, uh, he thinks it's, he's pretty sceptical. I mean, he doesn't completely rule it out. He's pretty sceptical in his life of Solon. Now, so we've got debate within a few decades of Plato's death. Um, Aristotle was taught by Plato, Cranto, early follower, leader of the academy. If even they didn't agree on whether Plato's just making it all up, I think this suggests that Plato was writing his text to be deliberately ambiguous, as we've seen. He's deliberately sowing all these conflicting clues in the text. Why? Because he doesn't want people to decide for sure whether it's made up. Why not? Because if people have to keep guessing, keep looking at the text, they're going to have to keep engaging in close textual work and interpretation. They're going to have to keep thinking for themselves. And that's exactly what Plato thinks philosophy is. Plato never thinks that, you know, a guru can just pour knowledge into a reader. He, he never thinks that's how it works. He thinks you always, that knowledge and only comes from within. You have to keep working at it. So what better way than to write through dialogues where he's not one of the characters, to use myths and legends a lot, like the Atlantis legend, which really involve the reader, including readers, you know, thousands of years after his death. It keeps us working at this, becoming active philosophizers. It keeps the myth alive. Um, and I think this fits into an even larger uh, notion in Plato that he thinks myths and myth making, myth telling, myth, myth reading is really important for a flourishing living society. He thinks that a flourishing culture will keep making myths and keep reworking and reinterpreting old ones. And he wants this myth to remain alive through the centuries, but he wouldn't want us necessarily to interpret it in the same way as even he was interpreting it when he wrote it. He would want us to, to look at it and say, what is it telling us now and our generation? 
So I think he's deliberately written something which can't be solved once and for all. I think it's absolute genius. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. We, we, we have lost, or at least we're not so cognizant of the power of myth um, in our society nowadays, I think. I mean, I think it, people are still using it without us being necessarily aware of it. But in one way that I think is very relatable to people is how we use myth with children. So, you know, if, if children don't think Santa Claus is real, then the, the, the influence of trying to get them to behave in December, you know, is gone. I mean, they, they've got to think that elf on the shelf is really looking at them um, because, <laughs> and we, we employ that like very strategically, but it, it has to be believable. Otherwise the myth has no impact. So, yeah, so he's got a very clear moral and political agenda. As we've seen, it's not just Atlantis that is destroyed by earthquake and tsunami, the prehistoric Athens as well. Um, so that's extraordinary. So Plato's also saying, yeah, virtue is your best bet. Virtue will help you against humans, but we're all powerless in the face of natural disasters. We're all powerless in the face of the gods. Fra you know, human hopes and ambitions and achievements are fragile. Uh, so he also wants to give us that warning to keep us humble in the face of the power of the gods. And it also, he's always also interested in civilizations being wiped out. It's a theme of his in the statesman, in the laws, and, and it, it allows him to explore not just what destroys civilizations, but also what helps them to rebuild what kind of skills and virtues do we need to rebuild again? So it, it gives him so many opportunities. And, and that, I think, is his agenda, the, this moral and political agenda um, and this, this sort of fable about human civilization and its rise and fall and then rise again. Um, that's what he's interested in more than did this really happen or not. It know? is amazing. I mean, so basically the, the, the gist is, you know, Plato has a, a desire to convey a very important message and to make it more realistic, he's sort of drawing on historical things to sort of fill out the picture um, and, and to make it more believable that, but the, the actual story of Santorini doesn't have anything to do with Atlantis. It's just memories and images that you yeah. can employ for his purposes. Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, you're just saying about the, the rise and falls of empires. And obviously you, you were yes. recently part of our yes. fall of nations and end of empires um, symposium. Uh, and so it, it is a very interesting topic. And, and lots of presenters spoke about the, the value of virtues. And this is something almost bizarrely not thought about as much in our current day, but thought about historically a lot more. And, um, yes. We even did a webinar recently about the Ring of Gyges as well, and Plato using that as another myth for the idea that advanced technology and advanced societies will inevitably fall um, and the cycle begin again. So it, 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 there are a lot of important lessons that he could be conveying. I, I mean, I, I guess, would people be able to say it could be the other way around, that uh, the story of Atlantis does happen, exist elsewhere, and that uh, Plato just is using local knowledge of history to fill in the gaps rather than a play, uh, 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 an Atlantis happening elsewhere that just has a different description that he, he's filling in what he doesn't know about the story of Atlantis with something more local. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, don't f forget that he doesn't set it locally. He doesn't set it on Thea and Crete. He sets it by the pillars of, of Heracles and the Straits of Gibraltar in the far west of the Mediterranean, just beyond that in the, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean. So that's where he actually sets it. Um, has he heard stories from sailors coming back? It's, it, it's possible, but uh, yes. I mean, but people love the story. So I guess the, the question is, what are the implications of it being a myth rather than reality? Because, I mean, people really want this to, to be a true story. Well, you say that. And I'm, I thought a lot about this question. And I'm not, I think we're ambivalent about it. I mean, yes, if ever you get Atlantis in a headline, it sells. And I think I've 
and I've made various TV documentaries, I think about four on Plato as a legend, you know, and I've talked about Plato's legend of Atlantis. It, it sells, it's popular. People are absolutely fascinated by this sort of idyllic island, which sort of sank, which disappeared. Um, and, you know, there have been attempts, there still are attempts to, to locate it um, all over the place. Uh, just almost, you you know, if you were cynical, you would say where people want to spend their summer, where rich people fancy spending this summer. Um, however, do at another level, do we actually need it to remain a myth? If we woke up and saw a headline saying Atlantis irrefutably found, Atlantis is discovered, it's not a myth, it really, that's it, it's been found. Would there be a bit of us that would be a bit sad at feeling we've lost out a bit? Um, I don't know, but I, mean, I think the discovery of Troy or the Palace of Gnosis. Yes. I mean, that, I mean, that emboldened this interest in history. And But I mean, whatever is, if even if something were discovered, it would not match Plato's description in the Timaeus and Critias, because we know, we absolutely know that he's making up some of those details as fairy tales. Uh, we know that some of that fairy tale stuff can't be true. So he has written a myth. It, if, you know, if it's found that there was some kind of lost city which matches it quite closely, how would we feel? I think we might feel have quite mixed feelings. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, we're talking about theory and yes, of course, and I, I've looked at the details in the text which link um, Atlantis with the Minoan civilization, but there were soon earthquakes and tsunamis going on in Plato's lifetime. For instance, in, in I think 373 BCE, uh, the town of Helike, which is I think in the Northern Peloponnese, it was just wiped out by an earthquake and tsunami, it just disappeared. So Plato is very aware that cities can just go. Um, and that really, you know, makes you feel very, I think, very fragile in the in the face of the gods. Yeah, and, and it really changes your, your mindset. Like, I, I mean, I lived in Mexico City for a while during a very deadly earthquake. And when you live with the thought that it, something huge can happen at any moment unpredictably uh your mindset changes i mean you really do have to live for the moment and even in modern day mexico you know the relationship with death and la catrina and dia de muertos all that stuff is very much more alive i think in a way that maybe you, you might have experienced more in the ancient world uh, where they also were more yeah. in the face of death there's it, it's amazing the um to go back to the power of myth and, and the use and the, you know, what do you think makes the story of Atlantis so compelling? Like, why do you think everybody is drawn back to it again and again and again? Well, it, it's so beautifully and vividly described in such luscious detail. I mean, it, it initially, it, you know, it looks so appealing bef before the lust for power and glory and wealth gets the better of gets the better of them. It, it looks just this idyllic society of, you know, exercise and, and races and sport and feasts and food dropping off the trees and absolutely it's all delightful. And I think it's quite interesting that in a lot of the modern sort of adaptations and reworkings and uses of the Atlantis tale, and there's so many, there are so many in films and poems and novels and music all over the place. Um, it's quite often forgotten that the in Plato's story, the Atlanteans are the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> they are. The, the tale is sort of said to be invented because he wants to find a worthy opponent to the prehistoric Athenians who are said to match his virtuous citizens of his ideally just republic in every respect. And he wants to test their virtues in war. So he wants a war with a really big, tough opponent to, to test virtue. They're the bad guys, or they've become the bad guys by this stage. They didn't start out being the bad guys. So, so I think partly we're drawn to it because, you know, we're just 
utterly um, seduced by this very beguiling and charming uh, city and its its luxurious lifestyle. So there's quite a lot of escapism in it. And we don't always read the moral messages that Plato wants us to read. We don't want to hear those. But it is also this gorgeous place which disappears. So that might feed into, you know, our fascination with lost worlds, yes. lo lost civilizations. Can we find them? Do they have things to teach us? But also I think it feeds into our fears, our, our sense of mortality, our sense of fragility that even as a place, an empire as great as Atlantis can just be wiped out, partly by its own hubris, but also by nature. So it's, it's feeding into a lot of our desires and hopes, but also our fears. So it's feeding into some of our deepest emotions. Um, and I, in exactly the kind of ways that I think Plato hoped it would. I mean, I think he'd be delighted to know we're still fascinated by it, still trying to interpret it, still looking for clues. And as you know, I've only scratched the surface. I mean, I we we only got limited time, but I could go into much, much more detail into the text and into exactly all the complicated clues that Plato is sowing on. Like, do we believe it? Do we not believe it? It's true, but at one level, and so on. So just, I mean, as you say, like we, we, we could, I mean, discuss it it's so depth and I think uh, well, I'll have to have you back again another day to do so, but um, to, to maybe finish up, what would you think is the, the most valuable lesson in it for us today? Well, I, th I mean, there are so many reasons we, we might uh, still learn from this, but I think right now, given what's going on in the world, I would say it's the the anti-imperialist message that we're at danger from empires, but also we're at danger, we're in danger if we try to create them ourselves. And right at the end of the Critias, um, before it breaks off, there's this wonderful passage where we're told that if you really lust after wealth, and power to the degree that you're prepared to go to war to get them, you're going to end up not just not getting them, but destroying the wealth and the power that you already have. Because wars are so expensive and they're so destructive and they tend to destroy th those who embark on them. And here is a quote. So it's in uh, Critias 121. Um, and it's talking about this sort of the, the pursuit of gold and power. Um, the eager pursuit and worship of these goods not only causes the goods themselves to diminish, but makes virtue also to perish with them. We will lose everything if you desire the wrong things and try to control too much because we're seeing empires are we not not just in the traditional sense of a country trying to build an empire and invade or have control over other countries you could argue we're seeing all sorts of you know social media empires media empires we're seeing a lot of imperialism at the moment in a modern form and and plato's message is watch out because you will end up destroying what you already have if you seek for too much more well said perfect <laughs> i think well that's a great spot to end so i just want to say thank you so much i think everybody will have enjoyed learning a lot about atlantis and hopefully the importance of myth and what the takeaway should be not necessarily looking for lost islands but for looking for lost virtue <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure to be here Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Classical Wisdom members can listen to the entire podcast with Professor Hobbs on classicalwisdom.com. You can also purchase Angie's book, Plato's Republic, a Ladybird Expert book, on amazon.com.